Hi, everybody. My name is Brenna Tegler. I am the Chief Fellowship Officer here at Activate, and I'm really excited to have you all here today to be talking about how to apply to our latest cohort, Cohort 2024. Applications are currently open. Um, I'll just quickly share, A, we're recording this webinar. Hopefully you got a notice. We will be doing Q&A at the end. I'll make sure to leave plenty of time. So we are in webinar style. So um, if you have questions that come up as we get going, feel free to put them in as questions. I have various staff with me, uh, Kerrigan Turner, Rick Kempinski, Leanna Liu, and Sydney Likens, all here are ready to and willing to answer your questions. And so we'll be helping as we go. Um, but we'll also have time to be answering them directly at the end. I also will share that a lot of the information I'll be sharing today is public, it's online already. I'll just be helping you find where to get it and what it means and uh, giving you a chance to ask questions. So with that, let's get going. And I'm excited to see you all here um, as fellowship applicants. Quick outline uh, from timeline to Q&A just to orient you on what we'll be speaking about. Timeline, where are we now? Uh, applications are currently open. They will be accepted through October 17th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we then have a rigorous down-select process, including different external and uh, internal inputs, video interviews, and uh, a finalist week with applicants before we choose people to invite to the fellowship in April and beginning on June 1st. Commitment to diversity. We like to begin with this to orient everyone with how we approach diversity, equity, and inclusion at Activate. We believe strongly that bringing people from diverse backgrounds, experiences, um, and that's not just uh, gender, race, ethnicity, but also uh, where you are in the United States, uh, your age, where, what is your university education background, um, all of the, and what is your experience with entrepreneurship? We look for people who have various backgrounds and we bring them into our fellowship because we think that learning, growing from each other is um, going to bring us the best success and um, have the best chance to be creating the impact that we want all of our founders to be having um, with bringing their science um, to the world. So how does that represent itself in our process? Uh, we have diverse selection committees that we train on things like implicit bias. We have a question on DEI in our, our application that we look at and take seriously. Um, we do things in in the review, like having blinded uh, resumes, we'll talk about that, uh, to allow our uh, our team to be looking at your materials without knowing who you are in their first read. And uh, we ask you to share with us who you are so that we can track how well we're meeting our internal goals on the diversity of our applicant and, um, and different pools of candidates as they move through the process and our fellows. Um, and we are happy that we've been able to work with external partners like the Association of Women in Science uh, that help validate and, and improve what we do. So let's jump into some of the details. Um, the eligibility criteria, this is public, it's been for a while, but I'll speak a bit about why some of these things are here. So um, bachelor's degree and four years experience in science engineering technology, this is here because we are supporting people taking science to product. You need to be able to do that credibly and safely. Um, we don't micromanage you. Um, the worst thing that can happen in this fellowship is um, a lab experiment where someone gets hurt. So um, that's really why we require this. If you are applying as a co-founder, we don't have as strict a requirement on this point, but the principal applicant, um, we take this we take this very strictly, um, but you can have different experiences that lead into this. If you've been doing the work at, at your company, leading that scientific work, um, then yes, you've been doing that for four plus years after a bachelor's degree, then you likely meet this requirement. Um, you don't have to have a PhD or a master's. Um, you could be working in industry, et cetera. So we take a lot of different experiences into account. Um, when we look at the requirement here. 
the next one must be leading commercial development. What we mean by that is people who are influencing the decisions that are happening around this project, this company. Uh, we don't take people who are first employees, and that's because it will be very frustrating for those individuals. We are essentially, in many ways, a mini MBA for scientists. And if the people uh, getting that training then don't have the chance to put it in practice with their company, that's not in anyone's best interest. Um, the next one I'll highlight is legally able to work in the U.S. for the duration of the two-year fellowship. We do not expect you to have a visa to work in the United States at the time of the application. But um, when you are starting the fellowship next summer, June 1st, at the latest, September 1st, um, we need to be seeing that you have that visa in hand for the two years. So we expect you to be giving us information about what is your pathway to be getting that visa, uh, um, where are you in the process? And it'll be an ongoing conversation throughout the process. Um, just note that we cannot sponsor, we are not employees of fellows. Um, so you need to have other pathways and in most cases be um, employed by your company and have that visa through your company. Um, I will mention this last point, 2 million in debt or equity funding, um, non-dilutive. So if you have a bunch of government funding that goes beyond that cap, not a problem. I'll also note that this has been in the eligibility quiz, um, the point that has tripped up people the most. So if you feel like you answered that question incorrectly um, and you failed the quiz, let us know. We can reset that for you. Um, and we can also talk about that a bit in the Q&A. Um, what is not required? Um, I like to highlight what we don't expect to see in applicants. Um, we don't expect you to be coming in with a ton of entrepreneurial experience. We, the point of the fellowship is to have scientists try out entrepreneurship as a career path throughout the two years. You don't have to be coming in already knowing how to do it. If you already know how to do it, you probably don't need the fellowship and you probably won't get it. So um, please, please don't expect us to be looking for um, having a lot of experience, but we do want to know that this is the pathway you want to take. There are a lot of other ways to make money, a lot of other ways to do science and make an impact. So why is starting a company, why is being an entrepreneur the pathway that's right for you? And what have you been doing to show us that this isn't just um, a, a quick decision you're wanting to make? Like, have you been doing i -Corps? Have you been talking to customers? Um, how have you already been testing this out in the ways that you can? I already mentioned this, but we don't expect a PhD degree. Um, we have a lot of people that come in straight out of PhDs or postdocs, but it's not a requirement. And same with the next point. You don't have to have worked or been at a top ranked university. Um, we celebrate having applicants and fellows from all over the US, from all sorts of universities. And that's, that's the same with the next point. We have our Activate Anywhere program that supports people outside of where we have in-residence communities in California, Massachusetts, New York, and Texas. So wherever you are in the US, apply, and we're excited to support you. Um, I'll note, we don't expect you to have already incorporated a company. You don't even have to have incorporated it by the time you start the fellowship. Um, so don't incorporate on our behalf. We want you to do it thoughtfully when it makes sense for you. And uh, we also expect you to be applying with technical risk. So if you already are selling product, if you already have a ton of revenue, you're probably too late for us. Um, if you're still developing, you're still figuring it out, then we are the right fit for you. Uh, we provided a bit more information on what we look for currently at our apply page. So check that out if helpful. Um, we have 16 different verticals that we support. Um, I, I flash this mainly because we have some tough lines to draw when it comes to eligibility around the biology space. We often bring in a lot of platforms or um, technologies that have impact in one of these 16 verticals. You'll note we don't have healthcare here. So um, if you're working on something that's specifically a pharmaceutical and that's only what you're doing is 
um, addressing human health, you're probably not a fit for the fellowship. If what you're doing also is um, impacting, we do have life science, I guess is my point, is that um, if what you're doing is biology based, but also has impact on the environment, if it's saving energy in some way, or if it's mitigating the impacts of uh, environmental issues, um, or as, as I mentioned, if you have a platform technology, then you are a great fit for the fellowship. And that's a hard line to draw. So join our office hours um, or email us at apply um, at activate.org if you have any questions. So time to go into the details of our application portal. And here are the key steps quickly outlined. And then I'll go into a bunch of screenshots um, of how it will actually look. So when you click on our apply button at activate.org slash apply, it will take you to our application portal where you'll have to register your account and complete the eligibility quiz. Once you complete that quiz, you'll have access to the application. Um, you'll see at that point, there are a lot of different tasks for you to complete where then you'll have ability to submit your application. At this point is where you add your co-applicant as a collaborator um, if you are applying as a pair of individuals. And, um, and we suggest that you get started now on preparing your application materials. I will walk through what those are, are today, but we also have um, a link where you can uh, see all of those publicly at your own convenience. And then once that's all finished, you'll have a chance to review it in the platform. You can always save it, go back later, um, and then make sure you hit the submit button by the 17th in the evening of Pacific time. So some screenshots. We um, Your first step will have to be to register on the site. Uh, the site is SurveyMonkey Apply, and, um, and you'll have to create an account. Once you do, you'll see a, a screen that will ask you to fill out your eligibility profile. Here's where I mentioned some people were getting tripped up on this last question. Um, we have a bit of an explainer there, but make sure you read that last question very carefully. Uh, we're asking if you already have raised over 2 million in private capital. If you have not, you hit yes. And then you save your profile and note that you won't be able to change it after you submit it. So that's why there's this extra prompt that asks, are you sure you want to submit it? So if you want to double check, click no, and then come back and click yes. After you pass that quiz, that's when you'll get act, uh, access to the Activate Fellowship application. If you hit more, it will take you back to that original page where you can hit apply. And I'm noting here that there is this pages drop down where you can find access to our application specific FAQs, as well as uh, a page that will describe all of the application materials that you will be asked to upload to submit your application. Um, you can actually access these pages before you submit the eligibility quiz. You'll just find it in the top bar here. So after you register on the site, feel free to start checking out that information um, if you want a bit more information. So uh, once you get into the application, as I noted, there's a bunch of different tasks to complete. Uh, you will also see your application ID all over the place, and you'll need that ID when you are submitting those uploads I specified. Um, our team wants to be able to tie the application in our system to the different PDFs you're submitting. That's why we ask you to put it in the title. Um, so you'll start with task one, filling out the principal applicant details. And I'll emphasize here that to get to this point, you need to have passed the eligibility quiz, which means that the individual who wants to be the principal applicant should be filling in the eligibility quiz. And that is the person that also needs to strictly meet those eligibility requirements. If you are wanting at this point to add a co-applicant, um, in that first task, we have a question, are you applying with a co-applicant? And then we um, instruct you to say yes. Add that person's email. This is mostly for us to be able to match it on the back end. This email does nothing. You then, after you complete, uh, hit next and complete this task, it will move you to task 1A, which you won't have seen before, which is the co-applicant details. And at that point, 
you add a collaborator because you as the principal applicant cannot fill out the co-applicant details. So you add a collaborator, you put their name, you put a message if you wish, you send the invite. And then when that person accepts it, they'll receive an email. They'll be able to do the same thing, register, log in, go to task 1A and complete the section for themselves. After all the sections are completed, you'll see I've only in my pretend application filling out completed one of seven. Once you've completed seven of seven, this will show up as a green box and you'll be able to hit submit and your application will be done. Um, some, some quick thoughts on troubleshooting, just to note. Each of those tasks I show, there's five of them. Uh, two others get added if you add a collaborator. They have multiple pages. So um, just because you complete one page in a task, that task is not done. You'll have to, to save and continue and keep moving through that task. Um, you'll be able to jump through the different tasks if you wish. Like if you want to fill out the project information first, come back to fill out some of the personal info. Um, that's not usually done, but you can technically do them out of order. Um, and save and go back later. Just note that to save a page, you need to complete all of the required questions. And um, I've been noting that you can have a principal and a co-applicant that apply together up to two individuals. You can collaborate on the later tasks about the communities and projects, uh, task three, four, and five but you each have to complete your own personal information. So that's task one and two for the principal, one A and two A for the collaborator. And if you have questions about what the fellowship contains, if, the, if you have any specific application questions about the content you should be submitting, we have a lot of that specified in our FAQs. If you don't find what you need, email us at apply at activate. But if you're having problems with the portal, that's when I uh, go to this little information box, pull down the drop down bar, and um, you can submit an issue with the site and they can help you. Like if something's freezing or if something's not populating correctly, um, the Survey Monkey Apply team will help you out. Application questions and materials. So uh, I've been touching on some of this, but just to summarize all in one place, if you are applying with a co applicant, meaning you have two individuals that are both eligible, you're both leaders in um, a decision-making type standpoint of the same projects and company, then you need to apply together as co-applicants. Don't apply separately. Um, and note that with co-applicants, we are not as strict with the eligibility, which is why the person who is most strictly eligible should apply as the principal applicant. You cannot swap the principal and co-applicants uh, once you get started, if you decide that you want to switch around responsibilities, then you'd have to actually start a new application. If you do that, will you just let us know so that we can remove the application you had started from our system? Um, note that you also cannot add a co-applicant after the application deadline. You're all applying to a fellowship. We're evaluating you as people. And so everyone needs to go through the process together of evaluation. Um, the main thing other than eligibility that goes into choosing who should be the principal and the co-applicant um, to note is that we often only fund the stipend and benefits for one individual of a co-founder team. And the individual who is the default person who will be funded is the person who applies as the principal applicant. Um, we can have some flexibility on that later, but our team will be evaluating your application with that um, with that framework in mind. Um, the reason I specify stipend and benefits here is we also provide 100K to the company, and that can be shared equally between individuals. Um, and then we have extra funding that you can apply for, um, 75K or higher, that also goes to the company and not to the individuals. So, Talked a lot about the people. What about the different communities you can apply to? This year, we have five communities you can apply for. Um, to name them in order of launch, that's Berkeley, Boston, uh, New York, and anywhere launched at the same time. And Houston this year is our newest community. Um, the way communities work is that you apply to be in a community or 
one set or a set of them that you're interested in participating in. And that is your home for the two years of the fellowship. You work within that community, with that team, um, and that's where you're based. And um, everyone uh, participates equally as Active Aid Fellows, um, but you are either at one of our in-residence communities um, and you work uh, and engage with those people in that community locally, or if you are not near or do not want to relocate to one of those communities, then you can uh, participate in our Anywhere community, which is distributed across the U.S. and virtual. To speak a bit more about this, this year you can apply um, for one community, if that's the only one you're interested in, or you can rank all five of them in your order of preference. Um, and that includes anywhere. You can put the anywhere community in any one of those rankings, um, except for one exception. If you plan to live within 70 miles of an in-person community during the two years of the fellowship, then you cannot play, apply to the anywhere community. Um, that is because the Anywhere community is meant to be supporting individuals outside of these hubs. So if you um, are within those 70 miles, that to us is a reasonable distance to commute and participate um, in person every other week, as expected by the fellowship. And, um, and we wouldn't want you participating in the Anywhere community, which is meant to support individuals who don't have access to that in-person um, relationship building. And uh, I'll just highlight it here that um, you and your co-applicant collaboratively fill out this ranking. And so you are applying for the same communities. Okay, let's dive a bit more into what information you're going to be providing to us about you and about your company. So we are a fellowship that supports people. We want to get to know who you are. And so we're asking these five questions, personal questions, um, and we ask you to fill them out in 250 words or less. Um, I won't highlight them other than to say, this is where we have the DEIB specific question. Um, and uh, we we look forward to hearing how you would be uh, participating in that and building an environment that is inclusive, equitable, and diverse in part of the fellowship. We also ask a bunch of information about your project and company. We support people in the fellowship um, that are working on a science innovation to improve the world. That is what we do as a fellowship. So we need to learn about you and we need to learn about your innovation, your product, your company. So uh, we ask a bunch of written questions again, uh, ranging from the vision of what you want to do, the details of your technology, to the impact you want to be have having with that work. Um, you can optionally provide uh, a short PDF, two single-sided pages with uh, graphs, referenced images, things like that um, to help complement these written answers. In addition to uh, those written questions in the application, uh, we have a number of attachments that we ask you to provide. One is a one-page single-sided resume about you. Um, and the second is a short slide deck on the details of your technical project. Uh, both of those resume and the, the slide deck complement what you were writing in the personal questions and in uh, the questions about your technology. Um, I'll note that we are strict with these page limits. So um, do not submit extra pages um, either in the slide deck or in the resume. Um, uh, you will most likely be marked ineligible if you if you do not follow the instructions. Um, and um, as I noted before, we ask you to include your application ID and the file name of each document so we can tie it back to your uh, online application. We have an optional section where you can be providing supporting documentation. Um, that's most usually the reference publications, um, but you, you can provide more in terms of graphs, diagrams, et cetera, if you need to um, in that first document. And then the second document, um, we also allow people to provide letters of reference if you have any that you want to provide, but that's pretty pretty rare. Most people are just submitting to us the details of the project they're working on. 
To dive a bit more into the resume, I mentioned earlier that the first stages of our review are blinded. So we require applicants to remove key personal information from their resumes. That's mostly your name, um, including in your email um, and any photos or headshots of you that would share information about who you are. So um, here's an example. If you wish to keep the formatting the same, we have people often use the word applicant in, in lieu of their name. Um, but to make this easier, we have both a template that you can use to fill out um, and an example uh, with different formatting to help you prepare your resume. Um, and I'll note on the resume, this is for both the principal applicant and the co-applicant if you're applying with one other person. Okay, the technical detail slides. We, this year, this is new, um, are asking for a three to four slide deck to provide additional technical details that complement those written summary overview questions uh, that we asked for before. So um, this is not a VC or business plan pitch. These are slides uh, to give us really detailed information about what you're working on. And as I mentioned, these are meant to complement the higher level overview provided in the other written answers. So we want a couple slides on your technical details, on your vision for your first product, and your two-year work plan of what you do in the fellowship. And that is the overview. Um, I went through that pretty fast. And the reason is because all that information can be found online. You now hopefully know where you can find it yourself. Um, and um, I don't want to be providing secret information in this webinar. We've worked hard to make all of this information public so that anyone can access it. And um, this is now a chance for you to ask specific questions of us and um, to help you feel set up for success in applying to the fellowship. So um, I'll leave this open and note one last thing, which is that we are holding, um, uh, I think the email will be going out soon. We will be providing t-shirts to the first hundred people that successfully submit their application. So if you're excited to have an Activate t-shirt, um, work hard to get in that application soon. And we look forward to seeing what you have in store for us, both uh, who you are and your technology. So I will, I suppose, leave this up and turn over to the Q&A. And we have about half the time left over. The first question here for the location city, is that for the business or the residents? Uh, or I guess business of residents. Um, in most cases where people are incorporating their companies, um, isn't necessarily where they're working. A lot of people do Delaware C Corp. Um, the location city is where you will personally be working. So most people in the fellowship are still developing their product, doing that scientific technical work and need to be doing that within a lab environment. So it's most likely where you need to be based to be doing that lab work. If you don't already have a place in mind, I would encourage you to look at our communities um, because we have different relationships with different um, I guess lab spaces and entities, and there might be a place where you would want to reside that would set you and your company up for success. Um, yeah, I see this one question, the application portal having five tasks versus seven tasks. Um, I, in my sample, added a collaborator. And when you add a collaborator, it adds two additional tasks. Um, one for the personal information and one for the personal questions. So if you're applying as an individual uh, by yourself, you have five tasks. If you're applying with a co-applicant, you have seven tasks. And I'll take the chance here to note that you can only apply with one other individual. So that means um, you should only be adding one person as a collaborator 
if you add more, then we're going to have to work with you on the back end to remove another person um, because the system isn't set up to handle more than one person as a collaborator. Um, someone else is asking, is there a safe note associated with the fellowship? So we provide 100K in research and development that is in most cases provided to the company once incorporated through a recoverable grant. Um, we have some partners, venture capital partners, um, who can offer additional capital through safes um, if A, you are ready for raising venture capital money, and B, you want to raise that money. It is 100% optional. Um, the base of the fellowship, we don't take any equity or fees to participate. These safe notes through partners, um, that is equity-based. Um, and yes, those are through safe notes. What are the in-person time date commitments for the in-person locations? So in most cases, um, we try to have everything be based on a Thursday and half day from roughly lunchtime onward through the afternoon. In and on some, and that's bi-weekly. So it's every other Thursday from lunch onward is dedicated to the fellowship. Um, that's a little different when it comes to some of our national education work. On Wednesday morning Pacific, I think 1030 for an hour, we have uh, educational content at least during the first quarter of the fellowship. So I would think about the time commitment as being uh, sometime during the morning on Wednesday and then a half day on Thursday um, for most weeks. But we try to keep the commitment that you uh, that we ask of you pretty light because we understand the most important thing you should be doing is developing that company, that science. Um, and really what the fellowship is trying to provide you is additional guidance and to help you develop your skills and mindsets to do the rest of that work uh, more effectively. Which community best supports life sciences overlapping with AI computing? That's a tough question because every one of them, um, like Berkeley, Boston, New York is definitely less on the life sciences. So if I had to choose who, who supported them the least, it would be New York. Um, but Houston is extremely strong in life sciences, um, as is Berkeley and Boston. So I don't really have a great answer. It depends a bit on... Um, where you would want to do your work. So I would look at the different facilities that are in those locations and where you would want to house yourself. Um, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, someone is asking the question, what percentage of your time have you been able to commit to the proposed project? Like how to answer that question in the application uh, for someone who is a postdoc, um, directly working on the research and spending a few hours a week during market research. Um, if you, if it's not 100% commercially oriented, but you have been 100% working on the technical side of what you need to do, I would say that you've 100% been working on this project or company. Um, what we're trying to understand in that application is, um, and this, and none of this has any impact on whether we select you or not. Um, it's more for our own knowledge, what kind of people we're able to bring into the fellowship. Um, who are the people that have a day job and have a side project that they're working on in their garage? <laughs> and so they're working probably zero to 25% of the time um, versus people who are coming out of academia in some way and have been able to focus on the project, um, probably in more of a 75 to 100 percent capacity. Can you include videos, GIFs in the slide deck? Yes, please. That is an excellent use of that slide deck um, and very creative way to give us more information in um, the small um, surface area, the digital surface area we provide. Um, do we, how do we provide the one to two reference publications, upload the full papers? Yeah, so um, we are trying to save our team time with trying, without having to hunt down your papers. 
um, and also save you space without having to do a bunch of official citations. So um, our preference is that you upload the full papers, you put them into a single PDF um, after putting them in a single PDF so that we can just quickly open that up and literally read those papers as needed. And our team does often do that. We we heavily dive into these technical details to be evaluating the um, both where you are with your project um, and the, the impact of it. Um, someone is from a different country and has seen different styles for resumes in Europe versus the US. Um, so um, I love that question. I haven't seen a lot of international resumes, but I'm not surprised. So to try to help with that, we have provided an example resume. Um, I would recommend looking at that resume and um, matching at least a little bit what you have with your um, international resume. No one's going to be disqualified for having a resume that's based on standards in other countries. Um, the main reason I'm suggesting to follow the conventions a bit more is to just make it easier for the information that you're providing to our team to be quickly absorbed. Um, because the quicker that they can look at the information you're providing and um, just like tie it back to the style they've seen before um, means that they will have more time to think about what you're doing, what information you're offering to them um, versus trying to interpret um, the formatting, if that makes sense. But no one will be disqualified for providing information in a different way. So don't worry about it and do what feels right and, and what feels comfortable for you um, if you want to keep it in, in a format that feels like it's something you're familiar with. Um, the three to four slides is hugely limiting. I'm assuming you're looking for an overview. Can you expand on what this looks like? Yes, it is hugely limiting. So we are constantly trying to walk the line here of providing you with enough information to give us the technical details that we need to evaluate what you're doing with also trying to not be overly onerous in asking for a ton of information that you have to prepare um, more like a government grant. So there are big pros and cons, right? We're trying to have it be quick and easy for you to apply. Um, and, and I understand that sometimes when you have to distill things down into a smaller space, it can be more difficult. Um, so yes, we're, we're trying to walk that line. So ooh, I think um, in most cases, providing data, pictures, um, yeah, just using the slides to write down information, I think is not a good use of the space. We have the application questions where you can provide a lot of those written overview type details. And then the slides are really to complement um, with what techno-economic analysis have you done? Um, what are summary graphs you can provide? Um, and yeah, what are, what's the more information rich um, visualizations you can provide on what you're working on to really help us understand how far along? Like, do you have just right now a laboratory setup? Do you have a prototype you could show or show us? Like, it just helps us really get a sense of how far along you are in your process. Um, we, uh, and feel free to use acronyms, jargon, things that will, um, for the text you need to use, can streamline what you need to write so you don't have to be writing a, a lot of words. Um, we intentionally did not provide an example um, this year. We might rethink that next year um, because we don't want people to just copy paste um, and like filling in gaps. Um, we understand that a lot of people are applying at different levels of technology and market development. And so we don't want you to feel like, oh, no, I don't have any data on this. Um, I'm not eligible. Um, so provide the information you have. And um, I would say provide like putting like four to six 
different graphics on a slide is probably about the granularity, maybe up to eight, where you can really see the details of, of what's there, uh, but it is still still, still self-explanatory without having to have um, just like an overabundance of information. Mm hmm. Trying to look through the other questions for some themes since we're about at 15 minutes left. Um, if you're the co-author on a paper, do you put the name of the other offer in the resume? Totally fine. Um, the other author can definitely be put in uh, when you're trying to blind your resume. Um, and and reviewers know that um, like this isn't perfect. <laughs> so if you're putting your name and the uh, any co-author, um, they'll be able to look up the paper. And that's not the problem. It's mostly that we want to be trying to eliminate as much implicit bias as we can. And that's just shielding your name. Um, the other individuals uh, don't matter. Yeah. Here's a, here's a common question. Where do medical devices fall within the purview of the fellowship? Uh, physical devices that are not pharmaceuticals but used during surgeries. So we have a number of fellows um, I, who have done like brain computer interface type projects. Um, and that clearly um, is a medical device te technology. Um, the way I answer this is if you are following a pathway where a lot of health type venture capitalists will easily invest in you because what you're doing is well understood and known within um, the life sciences type space, then you're probably not a good fit for the fellowship. Uh, we don't have relationships with those types of venture capitalists. Um, and we also don't have relationships with the big pharma companies. Um, at least not yet. That might change as we um, build our community in Houston. Um, but if you are working on something that that community won't really understand and you need help um, with trying to, I guess, like get early capital to be proving out that what you're doing matters and like building that story, um, then you are a good fit. So I would say um, if my answer still wasn't clear enough, email us at apply at activate or um, join one of our office hours so we can get into a next level of detail about what you're working on. Um, as someone's asking if they need to um, incorporate their company in Delaware, no, we have people uh, who have all sorts of different companies incorporated. Um, you will have to be incorporated in the US to receive funding from us, but it does not have to be in Delaware. Does the community in which you apply for or the order of which you rank them impact your chance of getting a fellowship? Um, for example, if um, we have equal slots for each um, community is applying to a more popular one of them, uh, equally more competition, 100%. So this is an important topic. We have our five communities. We will be taking in about 10 companies per. So that'll be about 50 companies total next year. We receive the vast majority of applications to our virtual anywhere community. And um, typically our newer communities are still building awareness. And so they receive fewer applications. And that uh, would be Houston and New York based on when we launched those communities. So I say keep that in mind. If you have any flexibility um, and are willing to be in any of the in-residence communities, and that in most cases means in-person participation um, at least once um, and often twice a month, then I would consider applying to those in-person communities doesn't necessarily need to be your first choice. You can always say anywhere is your first choice, but being if you're willing to rank those other communities, I would definitely do so. But please be very serious about what that means for your life. If you're like, I don't want to be in Berkeley two times a month, or um, I really am not interested in being in Houston, um, then 
don't actually rank it. We have a checkbox in the application that makes you double check this um, because any, any of those communities you rank um, internally, we will be moving you around to write, find the right fit between you and our different communities. And um, we only want to know the ones that you actually want to be considered for. Um, I have another question on the life science, and I'll try to I'll try to dive into this a bit more with this example. Um, a platform that has the purpose to discover new drugs, a high throughput essay technology, eligible or not. If those new drugs are also useful in agriculture or um, in like food and water, yes, we have many platform type technologies that have broader impact beyond just pharmaceuticals in, in the fellowship. Um, or if that platform is extremely risky um, and something that, as I mentioned, the traditional pharmaceutical players are not interested in investing in, it's worth applying. Um, if you're really only doing drug development and you have like like a vaccine platform or something, we the problem is we really can't help you very much in the fellowship. So um, it's not really a good fit. But again, if this didn't answer your question, email us or join in office hour. Um, does my co-applicant need to be employed by, by business if selected as a fellow? Um, can they keep their employment at a university? And are they required to move with the principal applicant to the community site? Yeah, this is an interesting topic. Um, how much we hold the co-applicant affiliates to our fellowship requirements. So as I mentioned, if you apply with two individuals, then it's most likely that that second individual who's the co-applicant will become an affiliate fellow, which means in name, in community, they're recognized as a fellow. Um, they can, in most cases, um, access the company funding we provide and um, participate with all the learnings that we offer through the fellowship. Um, if that, individ that individual needs to pay for themselves because we are not providing that funding. So um, we are far less strict on what that person is doing with their time. In most cases, we just expect that there is some level of participation with the community. That's the whole point of being a fellow is to be learning from the environment and the community the fellowship provides. So that's participating in the, the Thursday, the Wednesday, Thursday type um, learnings that I mentioned. And so, yes, um, they can keep their employment if it's outside of the company, um, as long as that's not going to create any IP challenges for you. Like we'll probably talk about that uh, and like what they're working on. <laughs> Uh, but it doesn't, it, they, they're not employed by us, so it's not a problem. Um, and are they required to move? Definitely not. So, um, but we we would probably debate whether they should be a named fellow or just participate in the fellowship in different ways. Regardless, they should still apply and, as a co-applicant. And we can talk about all these specifics later, depending on which community you end up joining um, and what the, the strict requirements of the participation in that community look like. Um, the question, tell us about a time you successfully mobilized resources is not under your control. So we do not require entrepreneurial experience to apply. But we do look for individuals who have some sort of entrepreneurial orientation. So this is an example of us um, trying to figure out how much you have um, been thinking like an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs don't really have any money, anything. They have to go out there and figure out how to sell people on their story, get people excited, um, and so that's really what this question is all about, is trying to understand what are the ways in which you have creatively um, brought resources um, to help what you've been trying to build. And there's some questions like prizes and grants, scientific grants, 
um, extra like organizing conferences. Um, I would say it's less around grants. It's more about um, like one example is um, have you convinced anyone to volunteer and provide like free CFO services for you? Um, or have you found any collaborators who are willing to let you use their equipment for free or for a low price? Um, like how are you um, creatively finding the people and the lab space and the potential customers that you need and pulling them, like selling them on the vision you're trying to build and um, and getting them to help you when you're not paying them to do so because you don't really have money to give them right now because you're still you're still figuring it out yourself. Um, how essential is a co-applicant? The co-applicant is not essential. You we um, honestly take more teams by individual founders. Uh, we do not have a bias for principal only or co-applicant teams. Um, so it's not, it, it won't impact whether you are brought into the fellowship. Um, and someone saying that this potential co-applicant will likely operate more as an advisor um, and collaborate on the process versus developing the company and the tech. Um, I would say if someone's operating more like an advisor, they're not going to be a co-applicant. Um, but you should tell us that you have people on your team in that capacity. Here's another example of resources, like bringing in advisors is another example. Um, co-applicants are individuals who are pretty much all in this with you as much as they can, right? Like they're still having to pay for themselves. Um, in most cases, but they, in most cases, are thought of as co-founders um, and not advisors. Hopefully that's all. What are my obligations of chosen the fellowship? Um, so we pay for 32 hours per week of your time. So um, that means that you're working on your project full time. Like you don't have another organization you're working for um you're not a postdoc somewhere like this uh trying to get this project this idea is what you're doing full time with uh your efforts and um and then we we ask for a couple um things from you some regular surveying um some feedback oriented so that we can improve the fellowship on a quarterly basis and then twice a year we ask you to submit uh, what progress you've made so that we can be tracking how effective we are as a fellowship program and also report out to sponsors so that we can continue to get the money we need to be offering fellowships. Um, so there's some data asks we have for you. And um, a lot of it is participation asks, but that is because we, um, as I mentioned, we're trying to help you develop the skills and mindsets that you need to be effective as entrepreneurs. So um, we have both uh, national education requirements. We have something called elements of entrepreneurship. Um, that is um, once a week for the first quarter of the fellowship and an hour on a Wednesday. There's some pre-work associated with that. And then um, every Thursday, there is something happening. Either we have some national education or we have the local um, community building meeting up in person um, or for anywhere they're meeting up virtually. So um, the participation on a weekly basis is like an hour on Wednesday and then half a day on Thursday. And um, other than that, it's engaging on a regular basis with your managing director. So um, we, uh, people typically have like one to two meetings a month, one-on-one -on -one with their managing director. Um, and that's advising, getting help and support. Um, and then there is a quarterly meeting that is held that is um, taking a step back. Like those, those mentorship meetings are like, what do you need now? What support do you need? Um, the quarterly meetings, you invite your advisors, some additional staff members from Activate join. Um, and that's when you take a chance to say, this is what I did last quarter. This is what I'm doing next quarter. 
And the reason these quarterly meetings, so-called, are a requirement of the fellowship is they're helping you get in the cadence of what will become board meetings uh, if and when you raise money. Um, and it's also helping you build relationships with advisors so that you have a support structure uh, that continues past the two years of the fellowship. So um, those are the, the basic requirements we have. And um, in most cases, they're set. They are, the, what we've learned will help you learn how to be an entrepreneur and set you up for success both within and outside of the fellowship. Mm. Yes, so someone's asking about other competitive technologies. Um, do you have to be the first one? No, you don't have to be the first one, but we do expect you to be telling us why previous um, times where people tried to commercialize this, they failed, or if they are successful, why is your approach better and more important? Um, if there's another competitor that's already out there who ha has a big head start on you, it's unlikely you'll get into the fellowship. And that's because we don't want to waste your time. So two years of your time, you could be doing something else. And, um, and so that is a high bar we place. We are looking for individuals where we can be providing transformative support. So are you going to be successful without us? Um, then you probably won't get in. And um, are you working on something that if it works, it will make a difference and it will matter. And that also, that's also that you're differentiated from other solutions. Um, that might be a good place to end. I know we have a bunch of questions that we weren't able to speak to. Um, I know we have more office hour signups if people have questions and want to sign up. Um, take a look at what we have available on our FAQ page um, and apply at activate.org is always a resource for you if you uh, can't get your specific questions answered. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop share and I'll thank everyone so much for joining and I hope you um, apply to the fellowship and we get to see your amazing people and ideas. So thanks so much. Bye.